Okay, so now we're gonna go through the land reform. So each of these countries has um, significant land reforms. It's gonna work a little different in each place. Okay, so the communists come to power, you know, Mao and the communists come to power in uh, China and they um, uh, institute um, extensive land report, uh, reform. Essentially, they violently uh, expropriate uh, the local elite and return the land, or not return, but give the land to peasants. And then they have small scale farming afterwards. And this is actually very productive. The outputs go up. But then they take a Marxist turn and they switch to those collective farming with the disastrous results that uh, I covered previously. And then Deng Xiaoping, when he comes to power, they switch back to small scale farming more explicitly. Um, and then you know China takes off in terms of economic growth and the podcast this week outlines that. All right. Now moving to the other ones, we have uh, a lot of these land reforms are influenced by this, uh, this American uh, economist, Wolf Lijinsky, um, who you've probably never heard of. I'd be surprised if you've heard of him. Um, uh, but anyways, he, uh, you know, his, his ideas about land reform are really uh, influential and these, uh, these land reforms that are instituted um, you know, really have positive uh, results. Okay, so Japan, does an initial, initial round of expropriation uh, you know, with the Meiji era. So the Meiji restoration happens in 1868. This is kind of the political event that kicks off Japan's modernization, J Japan's growth in the 19th century. Um, and essentially it's land is given to farmers. They instituted private property and they give land to the farmers. And the rice uh, and the production, the yields go up, which almost always happens once you have that transition to private uh, private property in agriculture. Almost always yields go up. You know, it happened in England. It happened in the northern colonies in the U.S. It just happened in China, as we saw, and it happens in Japan. Now, some of this land had been reconsolidated, um, you know, during the fascist era to uh, local elites. And so there's another round of land reform, land redistribution, after, uh, during the U.S. occupation of uh, Japan. So, you know, the U.S. defeats Japan in World War II. The uh, U.S. occupies Japan. And so they, uh, uh, they again expropriate land from the local elites and uh, give it to small uh, farmers. Okay. Uh, and just to go a little bit more in detail on this. So this, usually when you do this, so when you expropriate land, first of all, it's very difficult because, so think about what's happening here. You have a bunch of local elites who own lots of land. You are forcibly taking that land and then giving it to uh, the local peasants who usually are working that land. Um, um, and so, but politically that's going to be hard because typically those local elites have power. The second issue is you're going to have is in long run resentment. So those people who are expropriated are going to be, essentially angry about it for a very long time. And that may lead to uh, violence or, you know, uh, other sorts of uh, retaliation. So what is Advent or wh why this kind of works in Japan is the U.S. is the bad guy. So the U.S. is occupying. The U.S. does this. Essentially, they're, they're occupying so they can do whatever they want. They expropriate. I mean, can do whatever. And whatever they have, they're, they're essentially have the power. So they expropriate the land. Um, give it to the peasants, but the local elites then don't hold a grudge against the peasants, they hold a grudge against uh, the U.S. So this is how this is effectively done. Okay, South Korea is very unequal, um, less than 4% on, on land. Then after, um, after the war, North Korea does land reforms, um, and this sort of forces the South to reform. So the peasants see that the North, North Koreans are getting land, and so there's unrest. And so the South Koreans uh, do, uh, uh, do a similar land reform. And the advantage they have is um, South Korea had been occupied um, for a number of decades by the Japanese. The Japanese have affected, had, had, had colonized South Korea. Um, and so when World War II ends and the Japanese are kicked out, you had a bunch of formally, formally controlled land by the Japanese. Oh, my brother is interrupting the lecture. What's up, Mike? Cool. All right, I've just been informed uh, that my wetsuit is available for pickup. Okay, great, glad we could do that in the middle of the lecture. Um, all right, 
so you have this Japanese controlled lands um, uh, that are uh, that they're able to take and then redistribute to uh, the peasants. Um, okay, and essentially, you know, again, the uh, and they expropriate other land via essentially a rule that says the maximum you're allowed to have is three hectares. Um, and then they buy, and then you can, you have, you're basically forced to sell. If you have more than that, you're forced to sell it. Um, so you do get something for your land. However, this is not, it's not like market prices. It's a, it's ungenerous. Okay. So that's how South Korea does it. Taiwan essentially, um, again, under the influence of Legensky. So Legensky is basically pushing this land reform, um, in each of these countries. Essentially he's pushing it as a foundation for democracy. He's saying, look, these countries are in danger of becoming communist uh, countries. And so we should push this, not to stem the side of tide of communism, but also, you know, these are the peasants that are working the land, they should uh, receive the benefits to their labor. Um, and also it's like kind of the foundation of democracy is, you know, land ownership in, uh, in his view. So essentially, again, um, what happens in Taiwan is, you know, there's these two opposing forces uh, there's the U.S. back uh, force in in China, and then there's there's Mao, um, and the U.S. back force led by Chiang Kai-shek is defeated, um, and they retreat to Taiwan, and again the U.S. encourages this land reform. They say, hey, look, we did this land reform in Japan, maybe you should do this um, in Taiwan, and again the details are very similar to what happened in Japan, South Korea, is there's a maximum size you're allowed to have. We're gonna if you have more than that, we're gonna compensate you, but you have to give it up. Um, and this again is a, you know, massive transfer of, uh, of wealth. Um, you know, roughly 13% of the G GDP is transferred from one group, um, to, uh, the other. And the end result is that, you know, we, if we go back here, the end result is this high level of, uh, uh, uh equality for, uh, land. Okay. All right. And so this is, you know, this is a regression. Okay, now let me just take a second to uh, explain what's going on here. This is a from the Roderick paper that I cited earlier. If you're interested in the source, uh, is from this paper, Alicenia and uh, Roderick. Okay, all right. So what's happening here? We are trying to explain the growth rates in these countries. These countries have this economic mir miracle where they, they grow very rapidly from 1960 to 1985. So essentially what we're doing, our explain, uh, uh, the variable, our dependent variable, the one we're trying to explain is the growth rate, okay? We are running our regression where we are trying to explain it with human capital and wealth equality. Those are only our two explanatory variables in this regression. We're essentially looking at, given that these countries had this high level of human capital, a high level of wealth equality, what would we predict based on the experience of all the countries in the world who, that have these high levels of human capital, high levels of wealth equality? What would we predict the growth rate to be given that South Korea and, and Taiwan had these both high levels of wealth equality, high levels of human capital? And so our predicted growth would be this. So these countries were very equal, high level human capital. So we would, pr we would predict very high levels of economic growth, 5%, roughly 5%. Their actual growth was roughly 6%. So what this is saying is we can roughly explain most of this growth by just those two variables. Of course, there are lots of other things that matter. And again, this is just a correlation, ultimately a regression, unless it's like, you know, unless you're doing a bunch of statistical techniques and, or you're looking at a natural experiment, this is just a correlation, but it's suggestive that these two things, that high level of initial human capital and the wealth equality created by those land reforms were very significant in the growth of uh, these, uh, these countries. All right, so general takeaways, um, essentially these countries are, have the conditions for growth, it's just a matter of getting the right institutions and these, both these cases the market economy in China as well. Um, land reform is one of those things and I wanna highlight it just again because oftentimes I get so many questions about it when I teach this in person, because it's this weird, it's this like success story of foreign policy. Success, it's a success story of outside development, essentially a, a country imposing certain policies on another. That, so the, those almost never work. So it's, you almost never have development imposed uh, uh, from the outside. 
Um, but here we have an instance of it actually working. And yet it's a fairly unknown chapter in American foreign policy uh, history, which is usually, especially post World War II, is littered with uh, defeats or fiascos. Um, but this is one of the few uh, success stories, but we don't often uh, hear about it. Okay. And essentially, as I mentioned, with these Asian countries, they typically have high levels of human capital. It's just um, it's when they adopt market capitalism that they, or market economy that they, uh, that they, they find they realize some, some growth. Okay. Um, all right, we'll stop there. Although there's a lot, there's a lot more to discuss, but we'll, we'll, we'll stop there.